This star is pretty great. I think it's going to be a fraud in the future. At this point, it's not exactly a fraud. This is about the IRL app. So this was an app that was supposed to be a new social media app for Gen Z, meaning for younger people. They raised over $200 million. They had major VC financing and allegedly, so this is not proven beyond the doubt, but it looks almost certain. Allegedly, their user base on that social media app was 95% fake. So they had a social media app, 95% were bots. So you can imagine what was going on on that social media app. So now, and you might laugh, SoftBank was the biggest investor. SoftBank, you might know them from FTX, from WeWork. They're a major investor just because they have a huge amount of money. They kind of have their fingers in everything, but they write the big checks. They're not known to have the deepest due diligence, the most careful examination of what comes company they actually invest in. Although in this case, they claim they had very robust due diligence, and I'm going to walk you through quite a few bits. But SoftBank is suing them because they invested 150 million in the company, and clearly, according to them, this was a fraud. So as always, let me try to explain what IRL was actually meaning to do. So IRL stands for in real life. It was founded by Abraham Shafi, and the idea was kind of simple. You have Instagram, which is a social social media site around images and then the kind of have YouTube is around video and you have or you had Twitter which is around short-term text they want to create a social media company around calendars and events bear with me I know it sounds ridiculous but here's what they thought calendars are inherently social because every time you have an appointment in your calendar it's usually with a group another person it's an event it's usually something that involves other people which honestly kind of makes sense because because an appointment by nature is usually with somebody, so there is a social aspect to it. But that doesn't mean that everything in your calendar is a social thing. I would say if I look at my calendar, which I use every single day, I would say that less than 10% of the things I put in my calendar are actually social things. A lot of the things are just reminders, things I have to think about, exercise stuff. So it doesn't have to be social, but there is a social component. So they thought we create a social media site around calendars and events. And the goal was to bring back intimacy to the social media space because we all know the classic example we have Facebook it connects people more than we have ever been connected but it also isolates people more than they've ever been isolated because once you connect online you're usually alone you're on your phone you're not looking at people you're just looking at the screen so social media is something that is hyper connecting us but also making us very very lonely so they thought let's bring back the intimacy to social media by revolving everything around each events and by doing that we give people a reason to leave social media and go to the events let's say you have a social media app you open it up and there's five events and you can see your friends and then you say oh i go to this event and then you go there and you're offline so this was the magic of course there's a million problems with that obviously no social media company wants people to leave their site this defeats the purpose of your business facebook is a successful company because they manage to isolate people and get them online and think they're connecting digitally even though they don't so they benefit from that but if you're a social media site that says hey i help you to go offline great then you don't have a business that's a different story number two is gen z which is the younger generation young people aren't known to have a great attention span and i don't know how much young people use calendars i wasn't using calendars when i was a kid when i was a kid when i was a teenager i was almost never using a calendar i think a calendar is something that you use as you get older because you have very consistent routines you have things you don't want to forget and i think you're more organized and structured a calendar only makes sense if you're a structured and organized person which isn't really the young generation i think nobody who's watching this when they were a teenager they were big calendar people maybe they are but i think most people aren't but this was it this is your place to discover groups you can follow people like on instagram but everything has a calendar everything has an event so you had group messaging you had like a meme generator you had a lot of gimmicks and a lot of stuff but everything, the whole site, everything looked like there's a date, there's an event, blah, blah. So here's what happened. When they had that business about the real life event, let's go offline, let's make everything more intimate, more personal connection, people crave intimacy, then COVID happened. So their whole business was live events, like actual real life events. But of course, when COVID happened, nobody could do real life events, everything was digital. So they pivoted, meaning they changed their model to only do digital 
events, which isn't a big change because they already had the social media site. They just exchanged an address for a URL because now what would have been a physical event in Orlando, Florida or whatever, now is a digital event on Zoom or whatever other site. So they had to do that pivot, which is kind of ironic because it defeats the whole purpose. So here's the timeline of what happened. The company was founded in 2017, but they already developed the first concepts in 2016. So they created the first version of the company. The company itself was found Get Together Inc., but their brand name was IRL or In Real Life. They raised quite a bit of money. Obviously in the first year, 3 million as a seed financing round. In the next year, 11 million and then 16 million. So COVID happened, they pivoted to digital events and then they raised more money. But it doesn't seem like COVID helped them or hurt them that much because they've already raised quite a lot of money before that. Maybe it even hurt them. Maybe they would have gained more money otherwise. But now we get to 2021. So 2021 is interesting because this is the year when SoftBank is eventually going to invest $150 million and they're going to value them at over $1 billion. So they're going to be an unprofitable pandemic unicorn, a unicorn company worth over $1 billion, the absolute classic pandemic stocks, the companies that are unprofitable, but they have great potential because they solve a temporary problem, which I guess we didn't know at that point. But here's what they claimed. And now we get to the part that if SoftBank is correct, and there's a very good chance that they are correct. If they are correct, then everything in this little red box is actually incorrect. But this is the claim that the company made in order to raise 150 million from SoftBank. They said they're the fastest growing Gen Z social app, which is huge because Facebook notoriously has a problem attracting young people because the people on Facebook, there's a joke. This is where your grandma is or this is where your aunt is. I'm not big on social media anymore, but Facebook was kind of important 10 years ago, but now it seems kind of dead, at least on my side. But if you're a social media app that just connects with young people, you can be a dominant social media app in just a few years. Because if all the social media sites, let's say Instagram or Facebook, can't attract young people, then they're going to die out at some point because people stop using it. But if there's a social media site, for example, TikTok, you see little six-year-old girls, they're just dancing around with their phone. This attracts young people. These people keep using that as they grow older. So if they achieve the same thing, pretty great. So downloaded by 25% of US teens, that is a lot of teenagers, 12 million monthly active users, 400% year on year growth, meaning in one year they grew 400%. They claimed that this growth, which is insane, is almost entirely organic, which means that they didn't pay people, they didn't market to people, they didn't spend a lot of money in order to grow their user base. No, users love the product so much that they actually advertise themselves and they actually onboard their friends. There's a network effect. This is the big selling point. So they claimed that less than 50,000 a month was spent on marketing, meaning spent on actually getting people on board. This is similar to Clubhouse, if you remember, because they blew up. Everybody wanted to be on Clubhouse. They couldn't invite people fast enough. There was a waiting list and people were so hyped about it. They didn't need to do any marketing. The marketing was doing itself. Clubhouse obviously crashed and burnt. I think, I don't know if they're still around. I think they are, but nobody really cares. And they claimed that 2 million daily events are created. And remember, IRL is a social media site around the calendar and events. So 2 million events are created every single day. This is huge. This means there's a major utility. So everything you see in this red box, this is amazing. This is the shining, glittering little piece of gold that SoftBank sees and it gets dollar signs in their eyes. This is why they invest. What is actually hilarious because in the complaint, so SoftBank filed a formal complaint. So this is probably going to be a legal case that the founder of IRL is going to lose. But they said that they have a very robust due diligence, which mainly consisted of asking questions about this, but with very little proof, which is insane. Because due diligence should mean that you collect proof around the claims made by whoever you're doing the due diligence on. So if I tell you I have the most amazing YouTube channel, I have 5 million subscribers, I have amazing engagement, I get 50,000 likes per video, I get 2 million views per video. This is great. You have now asked me questions 
questions, but this is not true. So you should find proof to make sure that what I'm saying is true. But their due diligence of SoftBank seems to have largely been asking questions and getting the founders to commit to these answers and then to have them sign agreements and contracts where they actually put their name on these numbers or these commitments. So it's almost like saying, I'm not going to check if what you're saying is actually true. I'm just going to make sure that if it's false, I can sue you. It's almost like a reverse due diligence instead of actually trying to prove it and trying to investigate where you want to put your money. No, you want to put your money. You do two months of due diligence, but you're just making sure that you can sue them if he lies, but you're not really going to check if he lies. I'm sure they did both, but it sounds like from what SoftBank themselves wrote about the questions they asked, and I read the whole thing, the whole complaint, sounds like they didn't really look too much for proof, but they made sure that if they lie, they can sue them, which is actually insane because the founder signed all of these things. So in my opinion, he really is in a bad situation. I don't think he's going to get out of that, but I'm going to get to that. So now this is a crazy bit because also in 2021, now they do a third party report. So SoftBank is hiring a third party to figure out if the claims are correct because they claim 12 million monthly active users, which is a lot. So that means they have more than 12 million users because some people sign up and they just don't use it. So clearly they must have more users than that. But the third party reports finds that this app has only been downloaded 9 million times. So this doesn't make sense. So clearly there's a discrepancy here. So it's lower than what you're saying. But the CEO of IRL says, no, it's actually false because so many of our users are actually below the age of 18. And there's certain laws where you can't track them. So some download numbers are actually not going to be counted. So let's say it says 9 million, but actually it's 12 million because all of these kids, you're not allowed to count them, which even to me sounds like bullshit. I don't see this happening. I can see that this data is going to be anonymized, that, okay, these are teens, so we can't actually collect personal data on them. But if they download something, this is going to count as a download. If a teenager goes on my website, then I'm going to see that there's a user on my website. If they are protected in some way by data privacy laws, I'm not going to get any age data or whatever, or maybe location data, but I'm going to see that there's a user on my website. So this sounded like a dumb excuse. And they also said that they're not just an app, but they're also a website and everything that people do on their website actually isn't counted in the app stores, which is true, but it sounds like a stretch to say that, yeah, 9 million people download the app and then you have millions of people go on a website. If it's kids, if it's young people, they will probably download the app first because it's just what you do. If you're a mobile native, as many kids are, you're going to go to the app first. You're not going to do a sign up on a website, you're not going to take a PC and then search for the social media. So I know it's going to be on your phone. So dumb excuses. They have no profits. After this, after SoftBank gets a report, figuring out the downloads are lower, something is wrong. You get a really bad excuse. They say, that sounds amazing. We're going to give you $150 million. This is the insane bit. When I read that, great. In the complaint, they write that they had this report and afterwards they invested $150 million. This is their first investment. Whatever, this is SoftBank. We shouldn't be surprised. But then, of course, the founders got $10 million, more or less directly. So the way it works is that they have shares that they could sell to SoftBank. If you have a company and you have shares and new investor wants to come in, you have shares that you can issue or they can sell to that new investor. They buy some of your company shares. But some of these shares were held by the founders. There was a deal where the CEO would directly get over $7 million from SoftBank. And then the CEO would also give SoftBank a few more shares. So they were directly enriched by the investment. So this was personally to the CEO. He got over $7 million in this year just from the investment. And this brings us back to, we have an unprofitable company. We have major investments come in. People get rich in unprofitable companies for investments. Very similar to the Hopman case where I did the video, where we had this event platform. The guy walked away with a lot of money with a company that quote unquote failed. It didn't go bankrupt, but it didn't go anywhere. But because of VC money, got a lot of money when they exited. So, and as always, what these companies do, they make weird acquisitions. So they bought a digital nutrition company. You see that... When a company raises money, a lot of money, and especially when it's these hype companies, they start making acquisitions. VCs want to see you put that money to use. They don't want to give you money for bad weather. They don't want to give you money for, oh, I want to have a runway of 10 years. I want to make sure I have enough cash so I can be unprofitable for 10 years. They want to see you put that money into growth as fast as possible. So they made an acquisition, bought some company, clearly awesome exit for that company, but didn't do anything for IRL. 2022, the CFO, 
the chief financial officer, is starting to ask quite a lot of questions. Because the CEO and the founders have some very suspicious expenses. And I know we're talking about fake users. We're talking about 95% of the site is bots. And you're wondering, why am I talking about the CFO asking questions? We're talking about a fraudulent product. So what does that have to do with the CFO? Well, there's a second thing that was going on. So not only do we have an allegedly fraudulent product where 95% of the social media sites are robots, but on the other side, the founders also inflated their salaries. I believe the CEO had over a million in salary at one point. They had personal expenses paid with company money, which is investor money because the companies are profitable. All the money they're spending is investor money. So they had financial misconduct and the fake user base. So there's two things. So the CFO is an honest guy and he is asking quite a few questions. And it's so much that the founders are sending emails to each other or Slack messages saying, hey, the CFO is asking questions again. Can I send this to him? Can you double check on that? Oh yeah, he's asking questions about this expense. What should I tell him? Tell him we're doing some split testing and the costs are going to be a little higher for infrastructure. So they're sending messages like this. And I don't know where this generation of founders comes from that does not understand that everything in that company as soon as you get external financing doesn't belong to you anymore because you can be kicked out of the company and then they can see your messages. Charlie Javis, I did two videos on her, she did the same thing. She had obvious fraud in her emails, evidence of fraud in her emails, but she didn't realize that all of that evidence will be used against her as soon as she's kicked out of the company. As soon as she's kicked out of the company, they will find the evidence and they will sue you and you will go to prison. And the same, I believe, is going to happen to him because all the evidence is there. He not only signed specific statements that he actually said his claims were true, but he also left evidence of deception. This is the dumbest thing. Disappearing messages. At least SBF at FDX did it right because he had disappearing messages. He wasn't very smart about it, but at least he had disappearing messages. So even the staff at one point realized that, hey, 99% of the avatars, of the pictures of the users are uploaded by bots. This can't be right. Clearly, we don't have any users. Clearly, this is all bots. We're operating a social media site that is basically just bots and maybe one autistic kid that is wondering what's going on. So what did they do? They changed Slack to disappearing messages. It was like one month. So one message in Slack, which was the main communication channel, lasted for one month. They restricted access. So they had the family, like seven siblings and cousins and so on, and the CEO, they were all in on it. And they were the inner a circle and they would guard the information and the data and all the staff members they wouldn't get access very similar to FTX you had this inner circle that had all the secret information and everybody else would not be allowed to see everything so it's a classic classic scheme this should have a name we have pyramid schemes we have Ponzi schemes this should have its own name because Charlie Javis FTX IRL and I'm sure there's many more companies this is a scheme it's always the same it's a dumb one because the person always goes to prison but this is for Sure scheme. Then an article by The Information is published that is saying that all of these stats that you see in the red box can't be true. Like it doesn't make sense. These numbers seem wrong. And then in that same year, they're laying off a lot of people, which is about 25 people because they had 100 people at that point. Then an SEC investigation is started in August. So the SEC is investigating them. And what does the CEO do? He raises his salaries. It's, it's insane. 1.2 million per year was the salary at this point after the SEC investigation started. Started. So 2023, this is when the whole thing goes down, obviously, because now we have 2023. So the whistleblowers keep doing their thing because if you have an inner circle in your company and you're obviously restricting access to your employees, then they're going to notice and they're going to whistleblow. It's the same that happened at Theranos. They try to stop it. But if you keep your own staff in the dark, then they are worried that, hey, we might be participating in a fraud here. There were people that left that said, hey, I can't deal with this because I think what you're doing is fraudulent. So I'm not going to say in this company and you can't because you might actually inadvertently commit a crime if you participate in something even though you see that this might be a fraud. They suspend the CEO and the founder because he was basically stealing money. He was using money that was company money for different purposes. This is all alleged until he is in prison or until he has been convicted until a judge has looked over this. Obviously everything is alleged but still he was suspended for misconduct because of his handling of the finances. This is not about 
about the bots yet. Then after he is gone, the user base of the app tanks. It goes from whatever level they were at, whatever it was, 12 million monthly active users to almost nothing. It really tanks. So this is a very clear sign that something was going on, something fishy. As soon as the mastermind leaves, suddenly the whole company falls apart. Then the board of directors of the company starts a special investigation because they want to figure out what's going on here. Something is very fishy. The users are gone. This doesn't make sense. Then they find that, hey, over 95% of the users are fake. You don't have a business. You don't have a social media app. You don't have the fastest growing Gen Z app. 25% of US teens, you probably don't even have 1%. So you have nothing. And then they immediately dissolve the company. So what was the scheme that they were trying to pull off? So first of all, organic growth. This was the main selling point. They had organic growth network effect. Now, if you want to create an app, especially a social media app, it's so tough because there isn't really a space. There's so many overlaps. Instagram is overlapping with Facebook and TikTok. Twitter is overlapping with YouTube and Instagram. Everything is overlapping. So if you want to have a successful social media site, this is crazy. So if some company comes around and they have a social media site and it grows organically at an insane speed and it grabs the younger generation faster than TikTok, this is insane. This is amazing. So the organic growth part was what attracted the investors. Many of the investors actually only commented on that. This is insane, the organic growth. But actually it was bots or paid or they used these insane tactics. If you want to play a game, then you get free credits in the game. If you download the other app and then you go to the store, download the app, you get your credits in the game, then you delete the app. So it's like these tactics to drive up the numbers, but also pay a lot of money. So how did they do it? Because you would think that in a due diligence, they would figure that out, right? But they had growth spending, which was 50,000. This is what they claimed officially. Hey, we just pay 50,000 for marketing. This is it, right? Everything else is organic. But they had a huge, huge, huge cost for infrastructure spending. And this was at some point millions. But infrastructure spending actually was also of growth spending because this was just the false label to hide the fact that they had to pay for the users. They put millions into infrastructure and hope nobody would notice. And you would imagine that a company like SoftBank that is doing due diligence would notice, but they didn't. So they spent a lot of money on this infrastructure stuff and it happened to be growth as well. So they paid for most of the users. So what was the trick? Because there's always a scheme and you've probably heard the term related party transactions or just related parties. IRL is is the company we're talking about. This is the app. They gave millions to a related party. This is an agency. This is basically a marketing agency or it's a whatever, traffic generation agency. But this other agency was operated by the head of growth. So it is a related party because the head of growth is involved in two companies giving money to them and they spend money on bot farms. Bot farms, proxy services, special proxy services that are designed to evade detection any kind of shady stuff you can imagine, this is what they put their money. A related party transaction, giving money to a different company. Another fun bit, because this is such a classic with the inner circle, but I feel like they have nailed it. They really have made it work in such a beautiful way because they were also all relatives, siblings, cousins, seven people that were all kind of related and they're all co-conspirators according to SoftBank. So they're all being sued by SoftBank. So they were the inner circle they knew the deal. They knew what was going on. They restricted the access to the other employees. They had inflated salaries. They personally benefited by the buyout of the stock from SoftBank when SoftBank also had to pay them the 10 million to get shares from them. And then they had millions in personal payments, which is an absolute classic. You have to be very careful. And I've said this before. If you have a company and let's say your company is making millions, this doesn't mean that you can buy yourself a house with that money. Every company that spends money has to justify why this is a company expense. If your company that is also renting out property, then you can buy a house. This makes sense. But if your company that is, let's say, a marketing agency, and then you want to buy a house, and then your parents are going to live in that, that's not a company expense. So you can't just have company expense, everything. But they obviously ignored that. They had personal expenses, millions of that. And what I read, and I don't know if a partner is a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Let's assume it's a girlfriend, statistically speaking. CEO's partner partner, girlfriend, had a company credit card but wasn't even working for the company. That is so ridiculous. You can't do that. You have to be very careful with the expenses. You have to talk to your accountant. You have to ask if that is okay. Is that legally okay? Talk to your lawyer just to figure that out. And then lastly, the 
stupidity. Because if you want to scam someone, and I've wondered about this with so many people, you have to have an exit strategy. Adam Newman of WeWork, he had an exit strategy. He walked away with a billion dollars. He had an excellent exit strategy. He didn't commit a crime. What he did, you can say, was not cool, but he walked away with a lot of money. He had an excellent exit strategy. He hyped a company. He believed in that company, but he walked away when it got uncomfortable. And he walked away with a lot of money. He didn't go to prison he didn't face legal repercussions. But the CEO of Nicola, Trevor Milton, or Charlie Gervais of the company Frank, Elizabeth Holmes, Sonny Bawani, they didn't have an exit strategy. Wirecard, Marcus Brown, they didn't have an exit strategy. They went to prison because they were running this scam and they didn't think of the end. And I'm always wondering, what were they thinking? If you're asking yourself, this guy, Abraham, what was he thinking? I think he's a classic, not thinking fraud. And this is still alleged because he hasn't been convicted. And if he's innocent, and SoftBank has made everything up, then this would be heartbreaking. And then obviously I would have to do a correction video. But if I had to guess, I would guess that they're right. But here's what he did. He signed and gave explicit written statements that clearly, if everything here is correct, is not true. So he said that the active users are not bots or automated. He said that 50,000 a month is paid on user acquisition. He said that most of the growth is organic and that an active user is defined as a natural person and that there are no agreements with other related parties or entities. This is all stuff that turns out to be incorrect, but he has signed off on this. So he has basically signed off on being in prison for a long time. If you're a fraud, be very careful what you say. Never, ever lie to your investors. And if you lie to your investors, make sure there's no proof. Make sure you don't put it in email. Make sure it's not recorded. Make sure that you don't sign a contract with a lie and put your name underneath. This is insane. If you lie to your investors, you better make sure that nobody ever finds out and that you can claim that you didn't do it. Obviously, you shouldn't lie to your investor, but to explicitly lie to your investor, to write down the lie, sign the lie and say, here, here, you got the copy. You can copy this and you can store this forever. This is insane because to me, this looks like clear prison if this is the truth. Otherwise, it's just a horrible conspiracy. So just to reiterate, everything in this video is at this point alleged. He has not been convicted for fraud. It looks very, very bad for him. It looks like he is the next classic fraud guy. Unfortunately, he wasn't very flashy. There's not too many videos of him. Some interesting interviews, but they're all voice only, which is always a little more boring. Tell me if you want to see more of this case. Thanks for watching.